Followed by Amityville 3, Underwater Mortgage, and Amityville 4, giving it back to the bank. <laughs> Amityville 2, The House That Boofs. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing they didn't go with the original title, Amityville 2, The Queefening. Oh, oh no, there is no context in which I want to see Burt Young remove his belt. I'll teach you kids to bring art and expression into my God-fearing house. Okay, mistakes were made. They're gonna have to... So, Amityville 2, Electric Boogaloo. Uh, tell me, what, tell me, tell me, Casey. Yes, Jim. Tell me, Casey, what were your first impressions of this, um, of this, uh, I guess we can call it a film. Um, <laughs> right, barely. A film that we both uh, bore witness to. Mm -hmm. The very first time I watched it was one of those, yeah, I totally watched it. I was at a party and I was drinking and there were hot chicks. But no, I totally watched it. <laughs> when I finally got to sit down and watch the whole thing, after you like laid the tracks for me, I said, wow, what a great generic horror movie that's too bland and too 80s to actually be interesting. Mm. Then over time, I thought more about how this this movie, you know, as you slowly start watching more of the movie, you're like, okay, now when we get to the serious heavy stuff, it's getting way too big for its britches. And it just yeah. doesn't know how to properly delivering it. But as I finished watching, I was like, wow, it, like, it really laid the groundwork along with Exorcism 2 for really bad, phoned-in, bland sequels that's just ripping off of all these places, not having anything unique or original or interesting of its own. Yeah. I My first impression of it... Uh, I had gotten on a, I'd gotten on a kind of watching bad horror films kick, and right. this was quite a few years ago now. So, yeah, I think I came to this way earlier than you did. But it was kind of I, I made it my mission in life for some bizarre reason to watch all of the Amityville series up to that date, which I think was was 1996 or something. So I think uh, okay. at the time there were not there were seven or eight of them. Oh Jesus! And. <laughs> The Amityville series was never worth a damn. I mean, from the first movie all the way through to the remake, and I guess they're making another one now. Yeah, of course. Uh, my first impression of it was that I needed a shower after I saw it. Of all of the Amityville films, I mean, most of them are just sort of bland and cheesy. Yeah. And utterly ridiculous. And a lot of them just have direct-to-video. They just scream direct to video yeah because you know most of them have like the you know the the teenager who must turn into the slutty girl while she's in mm -hmm. the amityville house and you have you have the you could actually time the sex scenes by sid field measures so you could go like okay 10 minutes 30 minutes 60 minutes 90 minutes here we go sex scene or death scene must happen yeah. now and that's just, that's just laying the groundwork for, you know, for all those Friday the 13th movies where at least you know exactly what was going on. Campers are going to are gonna have sex and then die horrible mm -hmm. via, via a blade and a hockey mask. Mm -hmm. Or they, they even did a research recently with the, the last three Transformers movies and how yeah. you can almost go shot for shot with what Michael Bain is, uh, Michael Bain is setting up and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's not get into Michael Bay or we'll be here all day, but... Oh, good. Uh, I mean, my first impression of the Amityville 2 movie was there was something especially wrong with this picture in a way that was not true of any of the other Amityville movies. In that, as you say, I think, it gets... It, it tries to deal with subject matter that's just way above its capacity. You know, the, the incest, the, the family abuse situations that mm -hmm. happen here... The movie just has no clue how to make this work. And I think it kind of lays out nicely. Stephen King in Dance Macabre <laughs> laid out the this, this sort of three levels of horror. Yeah. I don't know if he's the originator of this or if he was just from someone else, but okay. he, he sort of laid it out. That on the top level, there's terror. And terror is what happens when you have a, a kind of fright that's not just emotional, but it's also intellectual. Yeah. You kind of watch the movie and you think if the world really operated like this, this would be the most ter this would be the most awful thing I could conceive of. Right. And a, a story like Shirley Jackson's The Lottery kind of gets to that where you're Oh yeah. where you think this is how a town operates just year in and year out. I remember reading that book, reading that short story in middle school and I was just like, "What? Wait, wait, it's 2 in the afternoon and we're learning this shit. Oh my god." Yeah. Did, was it? Yeah. 
Yeah. You're welcome, was, Hunger Games. You're yeah. welcome. It's just every sort of mad, small townish dystopia kind of feel owes something to Shirley Jackson's The Lottery. Right. So that's terror. Yeah. You know, and then there's horror, which is not really an intellectual thing, but it's more, you know, you care about these characters, you don't want anything bad to happen to them, but you mm -hmm. know that something bad must happen to them. Yeah. over the course of this story. Uh, you know, some of these people that you care about are not going to make it. Mm -hmm. And you know that. And you just hate to see it happen to them, and it's frightening what does happen to them, and there's mm -hmm. suspense and all of that kind of stuff. And I think that was the that was the level that Amityville 2 was kind of, was mostly aiming for, although it also seems to kind of gesture toward the terror, because I think on yeah. some level it wants to sort of throw some heavy theological stuff at you but it just right. the problem is i don't know that it really has anything interesting to say about any of that oh <laughs> it's there's just so much about the movie that's just so generic and so bland you don't care about the characters you don't care about the the idea the ideals or the ideology mm -hmm. that's going on with it you know and they totally forget that sometimes people just want some nice cheap thrills and horror mm -hmm. and yeah, the, and I could tell when we first were discussing about this before we even watched the movie. I was like, okay, we're gonna definitely be on the same in the same ballpark of this is why this movie sucks and why we need to throw ridicule at it. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, I mean, it, what it gets to really is the third level of horror, which is the gross out, mm -hmm. incest, ew, yeah. you know, child beating, ew, you know. <laughs> Flesh that comes off yeah. your face and then magically reappears for the next shot. Ew. Ew. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and various kinds of possession foo, as Joe Bob Briggs would put it. Um, <laughs> and like it's it's like a geek show. Yeah. It's a carnival totally. geek show, basically. And yeah, I, I think the reason, one of the reasons it doesn't work is that I think the movie wants us to think that the house is somehow making these people behave abominably. Yeah. But... The movie also establishes pretty early on that the dad is a sleaze mm -hmm. and and the abuse is suggested ev long before he even sets foot in the house. Yeah. In the opening scene, it's suggested that he's beaten his kids and, right. you know, and, you know, the Diane Franklin character is talking about how, how icky and gross her dad is. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like, there are things so wrong with this family that I almost... I think a cleverer way of making the movie would have been to do what The Simpsons did in their first Halloween special and just, mm -hmm. you know, have it so the house wants to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I really like that idea, yeah. And if only they had had the imagination of the Simpsons producers, which, granted, uh, would put them in pretty rarefied company, but... I know, right? Still, if they'd had that, they might have made a more interesting picture, but instead, no. Yeah. Uh, then Amityville 2 would have become a Spider-Man 2, and yeah. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't care so much about, spoiler alert, <laughs> one of the kids decides, I love you, brother, but I'm going to throw a bag, a plastic bag over your head. Oh, just, yeah, that. Just... Oh, and Jeepers. it's a step further. Even the kids want to murder each other in this movie. Yeah, just throwing that out there. Yeah, Fun. that scene. This is what, to me, separates it from the other Amityville pictures is that there, it feels like there's something kind of corrupt in all this. You know, yeah, yeah. That there's... When you see the kid get shot, or you hear the kid get shot, and then you see the leg involuntarily kicking, or you yeah. have the... You, you have the bag over the head, or the incest scene. Uh-huh. And saying, guy, you know, adults made this up. Uh-huh. Adults sat around a, a table and thought about this. Mm -hmm. And then they presented it to actors, mm -hmm. and I can't imagine what it would have been like to be these actors having to do this shit. That's that jump, jumping ahead uh, to things we were talking about. You know, when you said, uh, "What's what did you change your opinion about this movie?" I was like, I was watching. I was like, I feel bad for all the actors because they did some research into some of the other stuff that they've done. Some mm -hmm. of them are just working actors. What's his name? Uh, the, the, the the black detective police cop guy. Oh, the guy who played Turner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, played Turner. Are you asking me to let him go? Turner. Yeah, um, he was in, you know, The NeverEnding Story, and he was yeah. in Shaft, and, you know, yeah, he did Leonard Part 6, but that's nothing compared <laughs> to this BS. And he also was an off-Broadway actor, and, yeah, and, I mean, and yeah. I know. yeah, yeah, and... <laughs> And they probably were, like, trying to sell to him and be like, okay, you're going to be just like the guy in The Shining, except you're not going to die at the end. It's probably what how they were trying to sell him on. This is the kind of masterpiece we're going for. Yeah, yeah. the guy we're talking about, I just IMDb'd him. He's Moses Gunn. Moses um, Gunn, that's the thing. 
and he died in 1993. And uh, yeah, he was in Never Ending Story, Shaft, Heartbreak Ridge. I mean, he was just in a he's he has a whole bunch of credits to his mm-hmm. name. Mm-hmm. Going back, he was in Roots. He was in Oh, yeah, right, I forgot about that. Britannia mm-hmm. Alda had been in a lot of stuff and Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and Diane Franklin was actually kind of an up and comer at the time. You know, yeah, she was Probably her high point career-wise was the next movie she did, which was The Last American Virgin, which, oh, was, yeah. ac- which was actually in the annals of '80s teen sex comedies. It was one of the right. better ones. The guy who played the the guy who plays Sonny never did much of anything afterwards. He, he literally was, as you said, yeah. he was guard number three in Firestarter, and I was like, wow. Yeah, but and, and it's a shame because when you know most of these actors, you look at them and and. They probably were told, okay, in in the regular scenes that don't don't have any of the hair, the the mm-hmm. terror or the horror, you just need to act normally. Just need to act normally, like like it's everyday life or whatever. And then you just have to crank it up to melodramatic eleven where every time there's the horror and the terror going on, and that's just mm-hmm. when you see these completely uneven, opposing acting styles. Yeah. And it's... you know, sure, yeah. And I'm hypercritical. So I am hypercritical of that because I am still a working actor, but. I'm sure there's still plenty of other people who are just like, that. no, it doesn't work. That's why Britannia Alda, who's good in a lot of things, got a Razzie nomination for Worst act- Actress, Worst Supporting Actress. Yeah, the performances are really kind of, are, are really kind of all over the place. And I, I, the one person I feel is absolutely just tr- terribly miscast is Burt Young as the dad. Um, yeah. Give us a minute. An actor conveys douchiness. Excuse me. Yeah, but it's like... Classic douchiness, like a douche masterclass. What the hell is the matter with you? Well, I am married to you. Um, yeah, and it's not because Burt Young is a bad actor. He is a he's a he's a very good actor. But yeah, he's the you know he, for one thing he's the wrong guy to be the head of this family with these people yeah. who look nothing like him. You know. Yeah, it's these people nothing like him, and you see Britannia Alda, and it's just one of those things where you have to look at a couple and you're like, was this an arranged marriage? Because mm-hmm. He's not the most attractive man, and he doesn't have really that many redeeming qualities at all as a person. Period. Right. So, what, was it? Was it? You know, did they meet in an old school version of eHarmony, right. Christian mingle for for Roman Catholics, or how did they yeah, get together? Like, how did have this... three, have four children, mm-hmm. and then yeah? Because yet, how did how these did two stay... people get together? That was really the root of Burt Young's problem. That, and he was given a character who, quite honestly. Yeah, any actor would have had a tough time making the transition because, as we said, the abusive nature of the relationship was already was established from minute one of this picture, and yeah. so yeah, yeah, and so there was really no place to take it or make this look any better than it was. No, nope. no, nope. it's just it was absolutely dreadful. So, mm-hmm. riffing this movie, <laughs> what what were your favorite parts to riff? Hands down, <laughs> any scene with Ratanya Alda in it, mm-hmm. just because she would always just take it completely over the top. I mean, especially compared to all the other actors, like right. all the other actors on stage, they were they were reacting, and it was seemed like okay, that's a that's a bit much. I realize you're you know you're about to die, but okay, calm mm-hmm. down. But she she just especially she had full on Norma Desmond. I'm ready for my close up, but I'm oh, having yeah. a stroke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, those were really really fun. Any any of the scenes that had the ridiculously long beats. Mm-hmm. With the ridiculously long tracking shots, because you, because we just had so much things we could throw in there. Any of the 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 point of view demon scenes, where oh, it's like, okay, yeah. now now the terror, walk with us with the terror. Mm-hmm. Uh, those were really fun. I love that. You know, I look back and I, I used to say, like, do we do we have enough jokes or do we have too many jokes? It doesn't matter. The important thing is, no matter how good or bad our jokes are, they're not going to be nearly as terrible and alcohol inducing. As these long ass tracking shots and these long awkward beats. Those were all good ones for me. The last half hour of the movie is probably the most fun to riff, <laughs> mainly because there aren't any places there there aren't any places where there are scenes that make you want to stop yeah. and take oh, true. and take a shower. I mean, because um, basically in the last half hour of the movie, it's a completely different movie than the rest oh, of the totally movie. Is. And it and yeah. so many of the scenes are so unnecessary. They're basically the entire movement of that last act is, okay, Sonny is out of the house. We need to get yes. him back into the house for reasons that faileth human understanding. Because reasons. To, yeah. <laughs> so that we can do the exorcism scene, right? That's yeah. the whole that's the whole movement here. 
you know, it's easy to play. It's easy to play devil's advocate about these sort of scenes because I can do this all the time as, as an actor. Where, where they're like, there's no motivation for this. I'm like, well, I can tell you what the motivation is. Mm -hmm. um, and there's motivations about okay, we need to get him back into the house so we can exercise the demon, and then uh, we have to lay it back on the burial grounds and then seal off the demon forever in this house, and then and then like completely ban this house. And uh, uh, but the problem is, is that. There are all these motivations, and then you have to say as an audience member, well, actually, director or producer, you did not make this motivation clear enough. Mm -hmm. You have to speak to the lowest common denominator, and you have to explain to us how we got to this. That's what mm -hmm. how all good horror movies succeed. You take these gaping plot holes, and you justify them to the general public, and that's what they didn't do. Sorry, continue. Well, to me, it was it was more a matter of there are two kinds of scenes in the world. There are sort of there are yeah, scenes yeah. where something's actually going on and something's at stake. And there are shoe leather scenes. Shoe leather <laughs> scenes are basically scenes where not much is really happening. It's more just sort of we've got to move the characters from one place to the other place. You know? Mm -hmm. And basically the last half hour of the movie is a whole lot of shoe leather. It's people... It's Sonny must move here. <laughs> Let, because, yes. he's o because the plot moved him over here. Let's yeah. spend a half hour moving Sonny. Yeah, yeah. Or, or when the Padre is going back to the house because Sonny has disappeared. So mm -hmm. he tries to take Sonny to the church first. Mm -hmm. And then the Padre is like, where'd he go? He must have gone back to the house. Especially after that whole big scene about the demon saying, I like it here in jail. Ha ha ha. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, I mean, there are a lot of these sort of scenes that really don't exist for much reason. Or yeah. advanced character, they just sort of move them from place to place. And it's sort of make, it, it's the sort of thing that makes me appreciate Law and Order because they, <laughs> they cut those they cut all those scenes out. It's just whenever yeah. it's like we're gonna go over here, dun dun, they're over there now. Yes, done. You know. <laughs> yeah, if there were lyrics to that Law and Order, thing, you would hear cut to, and then no, there's there's just hardly any of that whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> as, as I think one of the riffs in the in the sh that we put in there was you know does cut to just not translate into Italian? Yep. Can yes, we... you did. Yes, you did. And yeah, it's it, that it is a it is one of the major flaws of the picture, but it also makes it really fun to riff because there's just mm -hmm. there's just so much nothing to play with. I mean, poor Moses Gunn. I mean, one of the reasons I feel sorry for him as an actor in this movie is his character has no real function. Nope. None. He does not need to exist. Yep. I mean, he's got you know, he's got the nice credit with the and you know and everything, but yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. The movie could get could get along just fine without him, but with other other policemen doing other things, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he he's basically he's basically a plot device, is all he uh -huh. is, which is actually true of a lot of people in this movie. The British yeah. lady, the you know, who is basically Miss Exposition. I know, right? Totally. <laughs> that other priest. Yeah. Whose name nobody remembers. Uh, uh -huh. Like who the hell are you? I mean he's basic. We basically make him sort of broke back mountain guy because, you know. He, he, well, yeah, for yeah. real. It's just it. He doesn't even realize, you know, because you could tell that that the the actors totally took all their scenes completely serious or whatever. But there are just so many concerns, look of his, and so many just the way it was edited that that everything he said was just remotely creepy, and you know. You made a bunch of jokes about about uh, gay uh, gay British writers, and I was making a bunch of broke back jokes. And you mm -hmm. know, you were having a dream. Never mind why I'm sitting up here and staring at you <laughs> while you're sleeping. But you were just having a dream. It's all right. Yeah, go back. <laughs> it's <laughs> so. What was the hardest scene to riff? What what, what was the <sighs> tough one for you? I don't think I have enough vodka left in this container. <laughs> Easily, all what I like to call the uh, the uncomfortable scenes, the scenes that's like, okay, and now we're going for shock value, not just gross out value, but you know, spoiler alert, um, any of the in the incest scene. Take off your nightgown. Oh, if she doesn't kick him in the nuts and run for the nearest cop, I'm gonna. Just for a second. Ugh. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, just for a second. What? Oh, the, oh, or you know, yeah. or, or edit this out. Uh, implied sex scene with who knows mm -hmm. anything involving their domestic abuse. Just, oh yeah, those you know were... that, that 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 scene. And and I was and I was wondering like you have to justify this. You have to make it abundantly clear why they're doing this. 
did the did one of the the younger kids throw the plastic bag over the little boy because the house was was possessing her to do so against her will, or did she really thought it was funny? Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. So pretty much any of those scenes, and you know, and when you ask like, did what, is it the first time that that Bert Young has slapped his kids around? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, his older kids, but his younger ones, and you know, just. It's all these things. You're just like I know we're trying to enhance just how messed up this family is to begin with before a demon possesses them, but just it just seems like a lot of unnecessary. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For me, the incest scene was a really tough riff. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that was hard to do because you know I mean the entire purpose of riffing a movie is to make is to make what's on the screen funny. Yeah. But that is really hard to do in that scene because what is going on is not funny it's and i feel bad for diana rigg too because uh, uh is that Di- last name rigg? diane franklin diana rigg was diane nowhere franklin. near this movie <laughs> thank god she she was <laughs> no way she would have done this picture but that's it i'm, I'm messing up too many names i'm pulling up imdb it's diane you know, franklin with, with diana franklin yeah just so many things you know like where we're studies around me like take off your shirt and she's like okay i was like what the fuck is wrong with you who, who would do that? Who would literally say, okay, well, you know, you're only my brother, only by blood. So, yeah, sure, I'll take off my shirt for you. That's not weird if we're both, if we're both, you know, at least 16, if not older. Just, oh. Well, I mean, I looked at that and I thought about something after I processed just, just how icky that scene is, was something yeah. that Sidney Lumet said about how what a rough go actresses have in Hollywood, mm-hmm. and that is you're not just an actress, you're also treated as a sexual commodity. And... Mm-hmm. And you're, you know, base, and certainly in the '80s, it was like every actress oh, yeah. who, who was trying to climb the ladder was told, "Okay, we need to see your tits," you know. And, yeah. And even if it's just a, a random shot about like, uh, so here's the hand, and your tits are in the background, but mm-hmm. it's 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 totally going to advance the entire plot of the movie. Your nipple, your areola, <laughs> is going to advance the plot of the movie. Yeah. You're and, welcome. And so. I thought about that with Diane Franklin. For one thing, having to get through that scene, and I don't know how the hell she motivated any of that. Yeah. It's just like, give, you know, even given that the family was abusive and everything, I just, you know, the movie I think was supposed to be selling us on the idea that this was an unprecedented turn of events. Yeah, yeah. And the idea that, you know, I, I don't know how she managed to get through that scene. Uh-huh. Without, you know, except to just tell herself, like, okay, just do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the check is clearing. That's what, that's why I'm doing this, you know? Yeah. And, because... and you think, and you think that, you know, this is me going off on a tower right here. You think that that would have changed, but I happen to know a few friends who are doing some Hollywood movies, some stuff around LA, and it's still that same issue or whatever. We're just like, uh, it would really help us if you got nude for this scene, and they can't justify the reason why. If you, you know, fun fact for those of you who are fans of other crappy movies like The Room, you know, there's that fun fact about uh, the girl who plays Lisa in that. Don't remember her name. Um, she had to, the very first thing she had to do was do that love scene, love scene, with Tommy Wiseau. And they, they reshot it and replayed the exact same scene like 30 minutes later because she's like, I'm, I'm not doing that again. Mm-hmm. We, yeah, we did that on one take and we're good. We are good. Well, you yeah. know, in addition to that, she had to be nude with Tommy Wiseau. So yep. that, there, there's an extra special bit of hell for you. Yep. Yep, Cause, yep, yep. Because just having seen his ass, you know, because <laughs> you, you, you do get a I'm massive, almost out. <laughs> you do get a massive view of his ass in this picture. Yes, you do. I, I think she she was also, as I understand it, she mm-hmm. was the second actor that was hired for that part because the first yep. actor was told, you have to do this, and she said, hell, hell no. <laughs> um, <laughs> with him? Ah. Uh. Yeah. To what what drugs do you have <laughs> at at concessions that yeah. I can? Yeah. You know, it's like uh, craft services. no, there is no amount of money for which I would do that. Mm-hmm. But in some ways, this movie is sort of a, a poster for for how badly women are are treated in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, for um, real. And also, it's sort of a it's sort of a poster for how badly you know women were thought of in the movie because. Mm-hmm. Basically, their entire function in this picture is to scream, fuck, and die. That's yep. it. You know. Oh, they, and 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 plot plot line. 
And even yeah. she was poorly misused because we didn't give two shits about her character. I'm like, oh, great, you're explaining it to us. Oh, great, we're ripping off not only The Exorcist, but Poltergeist as well. Mm-hmm. Great, you are so valuable. Thanks, British lady. Yeah, I mean, basically, yeah, they, they serve no other function in the movie. You know, there's a whole lot of victim blaming that goes on in here. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just like yeah. tons of it. So much. Because you feel bad for Diane Franklin's... You feel a little bad for Diane Franklin's character in that she's stuck in this movie. Yeah. Uh, and no wonder no wonder the father turns out to be the main protagonist. He's the only one to say, I am responsible for this. It's like, oh my god, somebody claimed mm-hmm. responsibility for this shit happening. Yeah. For the mistakes they made, all the terrible mistakes. Yeah. In this case, his main mistakes were, answer the phone, jerk. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that incest scene was really hard to was really hard to write for because oh, yeah. it was because it was so miserable and yeah I, to, and, to me, and, the, and even the mass murderer scene it was it was the why did he have to wipe out his entire family mm-hmm. was that absolutely necessary to wipe out the entire family could not there have been someone who have escaped and used that as motivation no apparently because shock value we had to wipe out the entire family or Ugh. you know actually for me what would have been much more interesting and exciting if i were rewriting the movie let him kill himself, and then Diane gets stuck with it all. Ooh. And yeah. then she has to try to get out of it. Um, yeah, copyright that shit. Because oh, she was the one, one of the two people that the movie was following for the first mm. hour or so. Um, yeah. It was basically her and Creepy Boy. Right. <laughs> and Creepy Boy I took to be the antagonist. You know, he was basically... Because you could kind of tell from the beginning that he was growing up to be a jerk. Yeah, kind of like his dad, and... and the few and the few lingering things he had still going for him were oh the love of his sister, uh, yeah. and then that turned on him. Uh. If, if it could have been, a, I think, a more interesting movie if she had survived and maybe she got blamed for the murders. Maybe the demon mm-hmm. was trying to basically the demon was really trying to fuck up her shit, not his, yeah. and and she had to kind of overcome you know the jerk ass priest and the you know and the demons and all of that other stuff and kind of find a way clear of it all. I think that might have been a more interesting picture. But no, they decided yeah. to bump her off because it's an 80s horror movie and women exist to be bumped off in 80s horror movies. Yeah. So we've been running down this movie pretty good and Lord knows it deserves it. Was there anything good in this movie? <laughs> if there's anything good, I think some of the effects were good considering the fact that it was made in the 80s. There, there were a couple of them, you know... I, I think when there were like little subtle hints of things happening, the you know the, the the pulsing tumors going on on Sunny and on the priest, that was that was kind of interesting to watch because it was sort of like the we're we're hinting at this this much bigger grander thing. But when you finally got the full reveal, you're like, eh, eh. yeah, it was kind of like, oh come on, that's it, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and that's the thing that sucks about horror movies is that if you don't if you don't nail that reveal. You've lost your audience. You've completely lost your audience. You know, there are all these little hints or whatever. Uh, perfect case in point with much better effects. This movie had good, good, you know, hinting effects and the reveal sucked. I was thinking about uh, watching the Lord of Rings movies. And the very first time I watched Fellowship, I was a big fan of the books or whatever. And I was just watching how good the effects were. And I was like, oh, man, with how they're building this up, if they fuck up the Balrog, I'm going to I'm gonna lose my shit. Mm-hmm. I'm losing my shit, and then I just see like the, pup, the 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 slow hint of the fire, and then he comes out. I'm like, oh no, no, we're good. Good mm-hmm. job, Weta. Good job, Peter Jackson. Proper's. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, and then I just uh, yeah, there was a nice ominous score. Yeah, so, Lin- so that actually Lin- worked. Shafflin did, yeah. Shafflin did a good job. As I yeah. said, yeah, he's the man who taught America to fear the sounds of children. Well, I think he was the also the guy responsible for the Mission Impossible score. So we've got a oh, yeah, you know, the guy knew his business. You know, that was, that was good stuff. Also, you know, the house has an automatically kind of creepy quality to it, you know? Yeah, it totally does. Partly it's because we've sort of, you know, the sort of, the hoax that got all this started sort of trained us to look at those Dutch colonial windows as if they yeah. were eyes. But, you know, the movie uses that to reasonably good effect, I suppose. Um mm. I thought, you know, actually the sort of basement, you know, the basement of evil, you know, thing where yeah. the where, where the sort of monsters come out of it and stuff. You know, right. not not the camera thing where the camera is the demon. I thought that was incredibly lame, but <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that was And all, that was and all the gusts of wind or 
Yeah, yeah. Just, there's just so many like gusts of wind or whatever, and every time you see it, after you put it one time in your head, all you can think of is just, just poot. Yeah. Lots of fart jokes. Yeah, there you of... enter the way of farts. But when they actually put something in that basement other than poo, you know, yeah. it, it was, in a weird way, kind of effective, you know? It was kind of like, yeah. that's, that's a little eerie, okay. I mean, it, it didn't end up amounting to much, but I can't say that that was, that was terrible. Burt Young was certainly yeah. convincing as a monster, yeah, <laughs> as a monstrous parent that you wouldn't want within ten miles of a child. Um, yes, I believed him. You know, I'm I'm sure that Burt Young in real life is a much nicer guy than that. Although, must be said, liked him much better in The Sopranos. <laughs> but then I liked everything in The Sopranos in the, much, much, better. much better than this. Oh, I don't, I don't know how it would have felt if, if uh, at the very end when the priest is getting possessed, if he goes, if he goes, blessed Lord, light of my life. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, if they'd done that about an hour in, I'd have been fine. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> you know, just man. Just, why just... is every time I watch a horror movie, they have to cut me off mid set? <laughs> if they, because an hour in would have been just as the mass murder starts, so it's kind of like, yeah. <laughs> And then it's like, okay, cool. I didn't have to see that. Yeah, uh, yeah. we're good. We're good. But yeah, I, I guess those were the things that I could va vaguely admire about the movie. But yeah, the direction was awful. The mm -hmm. the attempted tracking shot. I mean, it was it was an okay tracking yeah. shot that they had in the middle of the movie during the body discovery yeah. scene. I guess we'd call it. But and there was that. You know, there was some of the as were were haunt were haunting. We're haunting uh, Sunny, and we're like, oh, what if we start from the top, like like a baby, like that baby from train right. spotting on the ceiling, and then it looks down, and then it turns upside down, and it comes all the way back. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, fun. You got you got tricks. You got I mean, tricks. He, he he was playing around with camera angles, but it, you know what it felt like? It felt like a guy playing around with camera angles. It's like mm -hmm. I've got a boom. Check it out. You know. Like, yeah. Neat. Again, but it paved the way for so many other people who. Didn't know what they were doing with cameras. Things like Tommy Wiseau. I don't know the difference between digital and 35 millimeters. So I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy both of them, not rent them like you normally do for a movie. Yeah. And I'm going to film the movie side by side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good use of money. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, to me, the difference between this movie and Wiseau is yeah. with Tommy Wiseau, I get the impression that the guy doesn't know any better. You know, no, it's kind of no, like, no. you know, he, he doesn't know from shit. You know, no. he's an, he's an idiot. And it, it but it, although it should be said that I am convinced that the room is how Tommy Wiseau sees the world. You yeah, know, yeah. We have borne witness to the contents of his mind. Yeah. Um, As a reviewer described it, imagine if a gazelle was trying to make a movie about how humans interact. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 but it's from a gazelle standpoint. So they kind of know what's going on, but they don't really know right. how humans actually interact. <laughs> and, and with this one, you could tell that it was the director and the writer who just completely upsold them and just like, oh, it's just going to be just like The Exorcist, but not. It's going to be just like Poltergeist, but not. And it's going to it's going to change all your careers. And it's going to. Yeah, nah. yeah, it was. It, I imagine the pitch going something like one of those early pitches in the player, you know, or it's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of like Exorcist 2 meets Poltergeist, you know. Yeah. Uh, oh, totally. Th th these were uh, these were presumably educated adults putting this together. Presumably. And, you know, Dino De Laurentiis is not new was not new to movies at this particular moment in his career. No, and he had some yeah. good ones, yeah. And, you know, he has, a, he has a few good ones, most of them just really in bad taste, and we can be yeah. thankful that Silence of the Lambs got away from him, because I am convinced that movie would have sucked if he'd, if he'd been the producer of it. Oh, yeah. Because I, I, I think in some ways his attitudes, particularly about women, sort of come through in this. Mm -hmm. It was just so uneven, and you could tell they thought it was such a good idea at the time. Like, oh, this will be groundbreaking in the 80s to have really long shots and long, long moments of just complete silence and gaping plot holes to make people think and these POV shots of the demon. Mm -hmm. um, I, I now see why you said this is what needed to be our first uh, foray into making fun of a movie because it was just – this. this is a bad movie that everyone needs to see. Everyone needs to see this terrible, horrible movie. Or, you know, or don't. Yeah. But, 
you should because it's yeah that's that's what I'll just say it's, it's just really bad and oh bless their hearts for trying and thank you thank you all you out in Amityville 2 land for having us make fun of you it was fun yeah that's that kind of sums it up for me so that's that's about wraps it up so that's Amityville 2 for you guys check out the riff track when we come out with it in a few weeks and keep keep your eye it's on the YouTube channel and the trailers thanks for watching eyes on the YouTube the trailers the Twitter all righty bye bye I went all the way to nationals with 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 my glee club. You must resist this temptation. Glee club can give you gay.